So there's three topics that I um, recall where I've been perhaps engaging groups. The first one is discourse with the Catholic bishop, Julian Porteous. Uh, which I had a very good discussion with him on the steps. It's quite funny because this was in the Sydney Atheists, had their big day out in the bus. We went to St Mary's Cathedral when they were coming out of church. And I joined the queue of people coming out of church to shake George Pell's hand. So I shook his hand and said, Surprise, George, it's Sydney Atheists. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, George said, Oh, no, thank you. I'm a happy believer. Mm. And he ignored me because he had to shake hands with all the rest of the crew, all the the rest of the congregation is okay, but Julian Porteous came up and said, oh, you're an atheist, are you? Would you like to have a chat? And we spent about 10 minutes, which is on YouTube somewhere. <coughs> so that was very successful. I found him yeah, surprisingly uh, accommodating and someone you'd have a, quite a, a good dialogue with. He's giving a talk in the next week, next couple of weeks too, did you know? Um, I don't have the details with me, on ethics on some forum. It turns, out, it turns out he's a bit of a hardliner after all, despite yes. what he was saying. Well, my Uniting Church is where I engage um, with quite a few religious people. I decided to undergo a campaign of visiting all my local churches and um, I had lots of experiences with them from one extreme to the other. Their main uniting cheap churches where they were most receptive. David Milliken, some of you might have heard of. Um, he placed an ad in the local paper saying, come and, join, come and see us in our church. All belief systems welcome. So I thought, ah, I'll put that to the test. <laughs> so I went along there and when I was asked, I declared myself an atheist. And he said, oh, well, I suppose we'd better make you welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and he did, and the rest of them did. And then they changed minister. The funny thing is, you, someone spoke about, that. was it Dorothy McRae McMahon, the lesbian minister in the United Church? Yes, yes, yes. Well, the minister in my Uniting Church is also a lesbian, Nicole Fleming. <laughs> it's about the Uniting Church. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and because I've been there longer than she has, I feel I've got a fair bit of credibility with her, which helps a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, they they do lots of things. They've got a it's the Circle Cafe in Balmain that they use, and this area doubles as the part of the cafe, and this is also the chapel, as close as you get to a chapel in the church there. And um, not just a church, it's a cafe. It hosts Balmain for refugees. Uh, they the Uniting Church supports the Way Wayside Chapel, which grew out of the Methodists many years ago. Uh, and similarly, the Safe Injecting Room, and that they run the Wesley Mission. And even the South Sydney Herald, I was surprised to find the other day, grew out of the Uniting Church. So they do lots of outreach, good things in the community. And when I go along to church there, I find them among friends and people who uh, support all of these activities are happy to talk about those things and we work together on those and the supernatural beliefs that we give or take. Some people don't believe in it and some do. So that's very successful. Another way of engaging with the community is ethics classes, the primary ethics classes. That's a typical classroom shot from the website, teaching primary students about ethics. And religion isn't really mentioned, it's more about universal ethics, things like compassion and justice and freedom, and um, all the principles that a student can understand. You give scenarios and the students discuss that. So that's a good way to engage uh, with, with the community, to give what's basically a non-religious view. What was the, your connection to that? I'm a teacher right. in primary ethics in New South Wales, a volunteer. I also the other uh, on the ethics lessons we've already had Fred Nile mentioned. Some people were with him, so this is my favourite cartoon. So this is Fred Nile's version of ethics lessons because he tried to get get the lessons banned. Yes. So his lesson one: if you can't get what you want, try blackmail. So I showed that to my students and they loved it. A because their ethics classes were in the newspaper. I that one. And we asked them what blackmail meant, and they knew exactly what blackmail was. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked them what bribery was, and they knew what bribery was, so we had a discussion on which was worst. They decided that bribery wasn't as bad as blackmail because you were offering to do something good for someone to get what you wanted. <laughs> and there's a, the obligatory mug shot, shot of Fred Nile and myself meeting. So I, I challenged him to a debate then and he never accepted it. But anyway, <laughs> this is, so this is part of the um, engaging the opposition, if you like. 
Number two is debating. So I've been on ABC Radio, The Spirit of Things, with Rachel Cohn in about uh, 19, about 2008. Uh, we had a debate with Muslim students at the University of Western Sydney. How did that go? And we'll, we'll flip through and show you some of those. Uh, Spirit of Things, with Rachel Cohn. And I was called the Arch Secularist, was my introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I can live with that. <laughs> what does Jeff Wright even say the word? <laughs> <laughs> what, do, what does Rachel Cohn describe herself as? Oh, she's into spiritualism. 90% of the ABC is secular and scientific and despises her. But I owe her the privilege of me getting half an hour on ABC Radio National, and that's worth a lot. That was probably the most famous thing I've done, I suppose. I thought it was very good. Everyone, I got nothing but good reports from that. And a uh, debate with Islamic students at the University of Western Sydney. I wasn't on the debating team, but I was part of the atheist group who went there. When we got there, we were surprised to find they were segregating the <coughs> attendees into groups. Men on the left, women on the right, and married couples. We're making a big concession to you Westerners. Married couples can sit in the middle. <laughs> it turns out that two of our atheist group were, was a gay couple. And I thought, go on and tell them you're gay and sit in the middle. <laughs> he said, no, 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 don't, don't mention it. We're taking a low profile here. So we didn't test them. That would have tested their tolerance. Uh, as well as the students, they had engaged the traditional Islamic orators who stand there and punch the air and mm. tell you how reasonable they're being and, and read the Quran at you to prove that Christians mm. are wrong and all that. Mm. And one guy was punching the air saying, Islam will conquer the world. So we're there to build bridges and he's there to conquer us. So so much for multiculturalism. I felt that the future of multiculturalism in Australia is not looking very good when they want to conquer us. And um, we needed to be escorted from the site. The crowd wasn't actually threatening, except that they gathered around us closely. And even when we were driving out, they were thrusting leaflets in the car window. So they weren't throwing punches at that stage, but they were throwing But there was a the story of a debate in the UK where there was a threat of violence from the, the Muslims and they had to shut it down. So, you know, it yes. went a lot worse in the UK. It went, yes, it never went ahead because yeah. the, these Islams objected to it. Next bit on debating, the Uniting Church held a conference called Questioning God, Faith and Atheism in Australia last year, and I offered my services as a guest atheist. I said, look, I look at your program, it's pretty light on on atheists, and you're claiming to be questioning God, so I'd like to volunteer my services. And I said, oh yes, you'll sl slot in here, so they gave me a chance to speak. And my original talk was called Building Bridges, the New Atheism Building Bridges to the Churches. Then I found out that their keynote speaker, his sole purpose in being there was to run down atheists and knock out the <laughs> nothing but devils. So I modified my speech to reply to some of his claims. One of the things he was that atheists are too rabid. So I made a big thing about, um, did you know what rabid meant? It meant a dog with a disease that made it bite other people to try and convert them to the same <laughs> disease. <laughs> and is that how he viewed atheists? And I said, what do you mean too rabid? Do you expect the atheists to be a little bit rabid anyway? <laughs> so I made this point, and he, he stood up and said, well, well, I can tell you're talking about me, so I better respond to that, and I better apologise. <laughs> <laughs> so that was good fun. <laughs> I was told I was very brave to be there. Oh, yes. <laughs> I didn't feel physically threatened at all, but certainly uh, under emotional attack from many sides. Um, another type of debate, just a couple of days ago, the Manly Selective School wanted a, the student and his father wanted to offer lunchtime talks on different belief systems, uh, so I gave a free thought position saying that anything can be questioned. So I put it in the format of asking them a question like, where do you think morals come from? And very intelligent young people in the audience would give their various views, then I'd move on to a slide that listed what I thought would be that range of views, which was usually very close to what they'd suggested. And then I'd ask them, well, secularists think such and such. We think that, for example, belief systems are made by systems of humans. And uh, morals are, come from our genes, which is the DNA inherited by the parents, and the means, which is bits of behaviour 
passed down from parents and society. And it was very successful. And um, in a few weeks they're getting a religious person along to give a view and they said that after that they'll try and arrange a debate, possibly between two sides. I also like to engage people on science who claim that how could the world come into being without um, without a god. So I sometimes use this cartoon. So you can see this is how the big, ga big bang came into being. It's an enormous firecracker and God has lit the fuse and he's running away and it says the instructions on the firecracker are light fuse and stand clear. <laughs> so God's running away. So I want to ask them where is God running to, anyway? Absent for 10 billion years. <laughs> since the universe fills, since the Big Bang fills the whole universe, where is he running to? Um, and um, that can lead to lots of discussion about where the, where the laws of physics come from and does it need a God to start it all. And if it does need a God to start it, is it an old man with a beard? And uh, yeah. the other question, yes indeed. If God started the universe for the benefit of mankind, as they claim, where was he for the first 13... 12.99999 billion years. Yeah. Wasn't he suffering from terminal boredom? <laughs> so the next stage is confronting religion. And uh, this is what we did at the <laughs> Global Atheist Conference in Melbourne where the Muslim protesters <laughs> were protesting partly against <laughs> Ian person <laughs> Ali, <laughs> the who wrote Infidel, converted like Muslim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the protest is there. Atheism is the cancer, Islam is the answer. Message to Ian, Infidel Ayan Hirsi Ali, burning hell forever. So us in the secular party went and just stood in front of them and folded our arms and stared them down. So I guess that was confronting them. Any women in that crowd there? No. 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 Yeah, that was quite a chance. chance. Where are the women? Where are the women? All the signs one. are made by the same person. Or group. They yeah. same yes, they are. They're the font. same font and everything. Yeah. Yep. One's got misspelled atheism though. Mm. And they went crazy with apostrophes as well. And some gays <laughs> in the conference. <laughs> <laughs> what was that one? Apostrophes. Apostrophes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Some gays at the conference had a big kissing exhibition in front of them. <laughs> 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 I, I wouldn't have done that. More confronting. Yes, yes, yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Next one was the yeah. this particular cool. local church, City West Church. Someone already already mentioned the City Church. Mm. I think earlier. I've, I've, they're all got city in front of them. I've got five row mouths and five row mouths of people. Mm. Mm. And what happened to you? The what? Uh, it's a anyway, place. Yeah, this, this is not in a church building, it's in an industrial complex. The reason is these happy clappy places make so much noise you can't have them in a traditional <coughs> church building which is normally surrounded by houses. So they put them in an industrial complex where noise is allowed. So I went along there, and as I've been to many local churches, in fact this morning I went to the local Anglican church and um, gently introduced myself as an atheist who was visiting all the different community groups to try and engage them in discussion, find a common good in all of us. What I didn't know was that the visiting, visiting minister was a Southern Baptist from the USA. Mm. <laughs> and the word atheist is worse than murderer. Mm. Or rapist. <laughs> rapist, yeah. Oh, no. yeah. yeah. So, he disappeared for a bit and then oh, came his God. sermon kind. <laughs> I realized he modified his sermon for my benefit. Oh. <laughs> and it was all about how good God botherers will not even give their time of day to an atheist in their midst <laughs> to speak to me. We quoted John 12 something or other, which indeed said that. If you find a non-believer, and have nothing to do with him. So mm. it's the first time I've had a sermon created in my benefit. So. <laughs> <laughs> then afterwards, oh, I... Who are they affiliated with? Are they uh, like... Um, yeah, I've never seen Assemblies of God. Assemblies of God. Yeah. I don't know. Assemblies they're saying Assemblies of God. But, but I'm told that they're not normally that antagonistic to minorities. No, no, no. You can have a look at their website. Afterwards, there are a lot of young people there, so I tried to engage them. All of these places give you coffee and cake afterwards, which is great. Did they give you any? A bag of chocolates. Yeah, they gave they them gave before, I, before they knew I was an atheist. <laughs> and um, anyway, I had the coffee and cake and chatting to them. I said, look, your minister's telling you that the world was created 6,000 years ago, and geologists tell us that it's 
for like 13, the universe, 13 billion years and the earth about 4 billion years. And uh, your minister was telling you that uh, Jesus was born of a virgin. Well, if you go to university, as I hope some of you will, in medical school you're going to learn that humans are created by the fusion of an egg and a sperm. <laughs> and how does that tie in with, with a woman being made pregnant by a ghost? And a resurrection and <laughs> praying to be cured of cancer and all this. And this Southern Baptist minister did not like it one little bit. No. He said, get out of my church! Mm. No! And the young one said, oh no, no, he's just trying to chat to us. We want to hear what he's got to say. Right. <laughs> You're undermining my authority. Yeah. Oh, Throw this guy out. Because sure. <laughs> you're so gentle too. And they wouldn't. Well. So he picked me up. He was a very big oh. picked me up and carried me out the door. And oh. me out the door. This morning. Oh. This morning. Oh. No, this was a couple of years ago. Well, oh. Oh. I hope you laid the seeds of doubt in the people yes. who watch this oh, happen. Yeah. So I'm going out the door oh. saying, sendtheatheist.com.au. Oh. <laughs> 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 I've often heard it said that um, it, it's Jesus H. Christ because kind of by definition he has to be haploid. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> genetically, yes. This wasn't the same Southern Baptist guy who got caught drink driving on the North Coast, was it? Yes. A couple of years ago, it's about the right time. <laughs> well, okay, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> Could be. Oh. I've got his name in my files <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, so I'm happy to go back there again, but I'd like some reinforcements. <laughs> oh, no. I'll be your security guard. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go with you, but I'll so if someone will come with me, I'll go, I'll go back there again, yes. but on my own, I'm a bit vulnerable. Though. I know. Yes. You should put it on uh, your next proposed visit on, on the website. Or, yeah. Give people a chance to know about. Yeah, send it through. Yeah. Could do that. I've been to quite a few now. Now we'll move on to <laughs> phase four. We're going up the ladder now. We're getting more and more activists. You see, phase four is challenging. So I'll go through some of the activities I've done, which probably fall into that category. One was to build a fake Pope mobile. Oh, yes. <laughs> so you can see this is on the top of the family saloon, family car. There's a a glass case with a model Pope in it, and he's got a gold <laughs> telephone connected to a gold satellite dish. The problem is in the Southern Hemisphere, he doesn't know which way to point the dish to talk to God. So, I used to work in satellite communications. And I managed to get this into the car park at St. Mary's. Well, the <laughs> <was there. laughs> so I looked out of the car, took a photo, and that was about the microsecond I had before they moved me on. So there you go. And this was in all the pill Pilgrims were there for World Youth Day, and a lot of the young people in the street outside um, thought, oh, said, oh look, it's the Pope, El Papa, or something like that, they thought. And they rushed up, they realised it was all a joke, but they wanted to be photographed in front of the Pope, because they knew they were never going to get that close to the <laughs> photo to take home. <laughs> so I guess that was challenging. And then there was the Questioning Evolution Tour by the US Creation Ministries International last, uh, earlier this year. Uh, Ken Ham wasn't there, but two other Australians were. Wasn't that Safati was involved? Yes. Jonathan was Safati there was there. Mm. Yeah. However you say it, anyway. <laughs> he calls it Safati. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. And another Australian whose name escapes me for the moment. It's very odd that in the US Creation Ministries International, three of the top guys are Australians. Yeah. Basically, they got hounded out of Australia. The, the skeptics of been persecuting the <laughs> creationists in Australia, Creation Science Foundation. I've been personally doing it since 1980. <laughs> <laughs> I think it probably contributed to hounding them out of Australia, though they all went to the USA. Mm. So that's good for us and bad for the USA. <laughs> it's your fault. Yeah. <laughs> so the aim there was to firstly attend, get in and see what they've got to say. Secondly, if you're going to confront them, you need to do research because these professional guys, it's their entire job. Mm to promote, pretend they're promoting science that does creationism and they'll make mincemeat of someone like me, a straight honest scientist who hasn't been looking at it from their point of view. So I, you need to do some research on the web, pick out a few sayings that they've made. But they were pretty mad and kind of stupid. And <laughs> you know, but I don't think you did need background. I have no background oh. and yet it was just so obvious what they were saying was absolutely ridiculous. I couldn't yeah. believe that they felt people would believe it. No, but and their diagram, it was so dodgy. If you confront them, defeat one point they just rage on to the next They one. defeated they some of their own points during the same talk. It was impressive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, so you know, it's very hard to get somebody over the unit. Generally, I feel like you need a background on this. No, continue, Ian. Maybe you'd better see about what you said. Well, what <laughs> continue with your life. They, they don't have a question time there, so you need to interrupt. So I was prepared to stand up, interrupt, and say, That's bulldust. And say, I'm a scientist, and you're telling lies. So I did that a few times, and the guy always had an answer. And they said, Sit down, or we'll throw you out. Well, I'd prepared for that. I'd hidden a couple of um, banners outside in the garden, so if I got kicked out, I could stand and hold a one-man protest outside as they were coming out. <laughs> but they didn't throw me out, so I didn't need that. So you have, so you always need a plan B when dealing with these people. What, but you, before that, you were about to say something, but you can't directly yeah. confront them because they have they've got too many answers. You need to study. Yes. I thought so I'd done some research on the. What, you go to the uh, Creation Ministries International website, and you look for sayings by the people who were there, mm. then you go and get onto Wikipedia and you find out all the facts. And they usually refer to some scientific papers, so you have to go and get those papers if you possibly can. Because it's usually a grain of truth. Mm. Yeah. And you need to know what, that is. what the grain is and what yeah. the rest of it is. Like yeah. this guy said mm. that the question was how did they fit all those animals onto Noah's Ark? And he said um, that the dinosaurs they took onto Noah's Ark were baby dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> and after they landed on land again, they had a growth spurt which turned them into adults. And they quoted a scientific paper by a real scientist who said that dinosaurs apparently had a growth spurt, spurt in their youth where they grew put on so many kilograms a day. Well, I'd looked that up. And I had this scientific paper, and he said that they put on two kilograms a day, and this guy said they had to put on 15 kilograms a day to account for this difference. So I challenged him on that. Because you don't realize that the scientific paper was about such and such a species of dinosaur, mm -hmm. and what I'm talking about is a bigger dinosaur, so I scaled up the growth rate proportionally. <laughs> so he had an answer for it. And I couldn't immediately disprove it. So although I'd done my homework, they're so slimy, all he has to do is sound <laughs> credible in front of this audience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're going to go there, you have to do your homework, and you have to be prepared to interrupt because they won't let you ask any questions, and have a plan B for when you get well, kicked you out. Really really <laughs> well, that's that's in, you know. You but after all, they didn't kick you out, Ian. You're saying these they other things didn't. that we've been talking about today is part of doing your homework. Mm, yes. Well, you probably so need three people, even though you know. Like yes. Shops. I mean, like stealing. <laughs> I'm a small, carry on. No, uh, somebody was telling me how you steal wallets, you know, and you need three people. And they will, yes. they will, they will try and, oh, that more they will try and twist, no, twist things around so that you end up feeling like you've got a debate how many angels are on the head of the pin. But that's that's not really the point. You, you're still much better off if you've got some understanding of what of what the basis of what they're talking about is. Yes, if you've got some Bible verses to throw back at them, that's that's mm. that's real heavy action. How many people do they get at that sort of thing? Up was full, maybe a couple of hundred. Excuse me, I'll just be yeah. there. How many were I so oh, about, about five of them? Two. Are you no, we, no there's a few more? that you didn't know. Oh, can we, can yes, we, so we are moving to, to the end of this. Because we're kind of really. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, I always yeah. carry around, time. usually carry around a Bible with me with a couple of stickers in the margin. Yes. The first one is Numbers 31, which uh, talks about the Midianites. Mm. And the Lord spoke to Moses, take vengeance on the Midianites and say, what? Well, so if we're, therefore kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman who has not known man intimately. Mm. But keep alive for yourselves all the young girls who have not known a man intimately. Yes. And um, I often meet people who say, that, oh, the, the Bible's all good, why are you criticizing? Then I quote them this package, passage and say, what do you think they mean by keep alive for yourselves all the young girls? And they say, oh, maybe they want to marry them or bring them up themselves. Just, just go home and read it yourself in the full context. Mm. Is and God giving instructions to rape children or not? Of course he is. So it's worth having your own mm. material on hand as well. And the young girls they are talking about are only three years old. Like a, they are not like a mm. 17, 18 years old yes. girls. Mm. They see nothing yeah. wrong with that. And then no. j just on at, at Manly on Friday, mm. Manly Selective, uh, there was a... 15 year old girl and to her credit she was a Christian and she stood up and said I'm a Christian and I'd, I'd like to question your beliefs that you're telling me what humanists and secularists believe because we're taught that okay the 
Old Testament has got a few bad things in it, and that's why we go mainly by the New Testament. So I'm able to quote that. And say that have you had a look at um, Matthew chapter 5, where it says, For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot and one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. And there Jesus is talking about the law of the prophets, such as God told to Moses, which is, includes a bit about the Midianites. Mm. So Jesus said it goes on, and Murray's saying, I better hurry yes, up here. <laughs> <laughs> Multi faith prayer room. This is a, another activist thing you can do to confront them. Most unis these days have a prayer room of some sort, so I made a roster to put outside it, which is a deity roster. Because we don't want the different gods to accidentally meet in the corridor. <laughs> <laughs> Friday morning! Yes! This is a bit easier to read this. You can see that on Mondays from 9 to 12 they have Thor. No, the silence may be interrupted by thunder. On Tuesdays they have Allah. No, no, no pork sandwiches. Wednesdays they have Confucius. Saying of the week, man who scratches ass should not bite fingernails. So on and so forth. <laughs> so we put up at that, U that at UTS. It goes on, and then the notes down the bottom are pretty good too, because it says that you'll notice there's guard bands between the, the talks. You see, you've got um, 12 to 1. The, the, in the Monday morning, you've got Thor till 12, and then the next God doesn't come in until 1 p.m. You've got a guard band, because if they accidentally meet there at the same time, one's a bit early, the other's a bit late, you have serious problems. And um, a few funny things there that you could read if you like, all made to be a bit light-hearted. So, in confronting them, I've been intending to start a new campaign called Truth in Teaching, because the University of Notre Dame and Australian Catholic University and even religious education in primary schools <coughs> are telling the children lies, I believe. Mm, yes. And we can uphold the truth and say that the if they teach that a woman was made pregnant by a ghost <coughs> and a man rose from the dead and so on and you can cure cancer by praying to a dead nun then we say that universities usually have a set of objectives which includes truth and honesty in what they're saying and accuracy we could hold them to task in that way so if anyone wants to join me in that campaign we'll have to look for an appropriate yeah. time and place mm -hmm. to start that because I'm teaching ethics now, mm. my position's a bit more sensitive. That's right. That's what you approve of burning churches down. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to rock the boat there, because uh, I, I could easily get kicked out of ethics teaching if I'm too controversial. Besides, you might have smoke, smoke, smoke pollution. That would be bad. <laughs> yes. Beautiful. <laughs> okay, last section. But just before that, I'll talk about... The different churches I've been to, I've told you about a few of them, I've been to maybe 10 different churches now, and I've started a bit of a rating system, <laughs> in case you're interested. Um, I don't have a slide of this, Where can we? but you can see that um, I started writing down the things I liked and didn't like at various church services, and I've developed three scales. One is truth and untruth, so if it's all untrue, it's minus 10, if it's true, it gets 10, so supernatural is a bad thing to have being good to your neighbour and um, supporting charities is, would get you nearer the top. Mental health issues also has a scale from minus 10 to plus 10. For example, in a lot of churches, the, the one in Melbourne I went to um, sang a hymn that said, Lord, make me tremble. The idea there was that you wanted God to put fear into you and then you felt secure in some way. And I called that extremely bad for your mental health. <laughs> Whereas the local Uniting Church doesn't say anything like that. It talks about being good to your neighbour and joining them in doing good campaigns, which would have to be nearer the top, and supporting people in need. And finally, looking, who do you look after? If you look at what they're asking you to do in church, work out who benefits from this. And in many churches, they uphold the first four commandments, which are all for the benefit of God, not about humans. So most of them are about sacrificing yourself to worship God. In some churches, 90% of the concept of, of the content is about bettering God to the detriment of yourself, which we obviously count as a very big negative. And if it's to look after yourself, personal salvation, that's also pretty worthless, not quite as bad as sacrificing yourself to God, but at least a lot of them talk about personal salvation, which is worth nothing. But if you're talking about looking after others in the community, then, then that would be a big positive. 
So all the churches I've been to now have got a rating on those three scales, and hopefully I can publish some sort of... Mm -hmm. I wouldn't agree with you, that trembling necessarily means fear, though. Okay, well we must move on. Of the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like an organ. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, what are you doing, <laughs> No, let's let Ian finish. Not too much time. <laughs> okay, overcoming. Now, in the top category now of activism, I'll just mention three things. These are now some sort of successes that have been achieved which you might have heard about. First of all, well, there was the High Court challenge against the chaplain programs in schools being funded by the government, by Ron Williams in Queensland, which was partly successful. I found out that it was in violation of some rules, yeah, but not, to do but not Section 116 of the Constitution, nothing to do with religion. Secondly, there was the census campaign, the Tick No Religion <coughs> box. Well, the ad advertisements run by the Australian atheist foundation, if I've got that right, uh, no doubt contributed to the increase in ticking the no religion box from, if I've got the figures right, 18.7% up to 22.3%. The Jedis went up mm. quite a lot. Which is a considerable improvement. <laughs> and that's soon to overtake the biggest religion, with it, which is Catholics, currently at 26%. Mm. So watch this square at the next census. Mm. Once no religion is bigger than any religion. And religion. more than all the non-Christian alternatives lumped together. Mm. Yes, indeed. And finally, Jeffrey Robertson presented at the Global Atheist Convention, and he examined how the law may be used to fight, his spelling was probably better than mine, to fight religion and oppression. I've written a report on this for the Australian Humanist magazine, which will come out in November. And he addressed things like Joseph Coney in Africa, who recruits child soldiers and is still active, but to a lesser degree. Uh, who, who's heard of Kony 2012 yeah, yeah, campaign? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Well, I've, Lord's I first... Army, Lord's Resistance Army. Oh, mm -hmm. Lord's Resistance Army. So that's got a religious basis as well. Yeah. This was the topic of politics in the pub uh, on Friday. So it turned out I had three different things on Friday to do with activism. Um, and child abuse by the clergy Robinson Robertson wrote a book called The Case for the Pope, The Case of the Pope. And I thought he would say, that, and unfortunately it concludes basically that you can't sue the Pope because he was never in the line of responsibility for these things. But at least he's uh, put a lot of effort in pro bono time to investigate that. He looked at the Vatican as a state and said <laughs> that no validity as a state. It could be argued in a court that had no validity, has no validity as a state because it was set up by Mussolini in about 1929 and Mussolini's regime was overthrown, so you could argue that the things that set up are no longer valid. Well, it still has representation on the mm -hmm. And there's an Australian ambassador to the Vatican as well, which he says is just silly because there's a, the ambassador to Italy as a whole is just down the road anyway. And he talked about the Declaration of Human Rights and whether that could be brought to bear on the legal front to challenge religions. So. I hope I've shown you some ways in which it's possible to confront, to engage, debate, confront, challenge, or even overcome uh, religion as an activist, and uh, perhaps anywhere on the scale from outreach to activism. And don't forget the element of humour that comes into it. A bit of ridicule and a, a cartoon can go a long way. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you very much.